We are going to begin today, um, the first section that I am tasked with is the origin and history of the law, and you're probably going to be like, wow, I just rolled out of bed, right, Alex? I'm ready to take a nap. This is your session. Nap this session, and then be awake for the next ones, because it's going to be a little bit more you know, practical and relevant. But we're going to start here with the idea of the law being written on our hearts. And we see this particularly in Romans chapter 2, verses 14 through 15. I'm going to read that for you. It is in your book. This is out of the New American Standard Translation. For when Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these, not having the law, are a law to themselves, in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. Now, if you're familiar with Paul's writings, you're looking at that like, I don't know what the heck he just said. Right, because it's kind of confusing. But the essential thing that we're trying to look at here is because human beings were made in the image of God, we bear the image of our Creator. We therefore bear His moral law within the very fabric of our beings. You do not need to be a Christian to know morally what is acceptable and unacceptable to God. Every human being knows this, Every human being rejects this, is what Scripture says, until the awakening of the Holy Spirit in our hearts to put a desire in us to walk after righteousness. See, Paul is going to reiterate many times through Romans chapter 1 that mankind knows God. Mankind knows about God's standard for righteousness, his moral law, and I want to emphasize this idea of moral law because later we're going to talk about other forms of law. But moral law simply means what is sinful and what is not sinful. What would be walking in the paths of righteousness, what would be walking in the paths of rebellion. And every human being knows this. Every human culture understands that there is an objective standard for righteousness, for good, outside of themselves. Because everybody and their mother has at some time said, that's not right. Okay, but the ultimate question for the non-believer is by what standard? Maybe I think it's right to murder. Maybe I think it is right to commit adultery. Maybe I think it's right to steal. By what standard is it wrong? And we all appeal to that standard. The standard is God's law. And that law is written in our hearts. If you turn, uh, you don't actually have to turn there because I'm going to read it again in your book. <laughs> Just keep following along with me. In Romans chapter 1, Paul, through verses 18 through 23, talks about this idea that all mankind is guilty before God. God's wrath against all unrighteousness is revealed from heaven against us because of why? Because we willfully choose to reject God, reject his law, and we suppress this truth. It's not just that people ignore it. And it's not just that we don't like it. Like, oh man, that's a really, that's a, that's a tall order, Lord. You want me to do all these things. It's not just that we say I can't. It's that we say I won't. And we suppress that truth, Scripture says. The word in Greek means to hold down under pressure. Because it is so inherently obvious to the imago Dei, to the image bearer, that this is right and this is wrong. Because God has woven it into every fabric and every molecule of your DNA. Sin is evil. Righteousness is good. Be a people to walk after righteousness. And we say, no. I'm going to hold this down. I'm going to reject this. I want nothing to do with this. Now, you could argue in the context of Romans here that Paul's talking about Gentiles who've never been given the law of Moses. They've never had the pleasure of seeing all 613 commandments written uh, before them. How do they know any better? And this is where we're going to understand that moral law, the conscience of men, is not written out. It's something that we know intrinsically. You do not have to tell someone that murder is wrong. They know it is wrong. Now they will either suppress that and sear their conscience, or they will acknowledge it's wrong. But you don't have to tell it. It's an intrinsic thing to us. And also intrinsic is not only the knowledge of God's law, but the knowledge of the penalty of that law. We know intrinsically that rejection of God, that a violation of his commandments, that a seeking of sin leads to death. And Paul reiterates that point 
in uh, Romans chapter 1 as well, followed up in Romans chapter 6. Verse 32 of Romans chapter 1, Paul expresses that we all intrinsically know and understand the penalty for breaking the law of God is death. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. And this is going to feed into some of the other stuff today where Luke is talking about the law and the gospel. And then what is our only hope and our only solution for the fact that we have all broken this law and that we all deserve death and that we're all headed straight long into judgment, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's move on now to the law throughout redemptive history. See, I like history. I was kind of stoked when this one uh, landed on me because I was like, all right, I'm a nerd out. Now, most of you may or may not like history. I don't know. Um, but we're going to do a brief overview of the entire Bible. So you're going to get all that crammed into about 10 minutes. Okay? <laughs> so law giving is a frequent thing we see from the very beginning in the book of Genesis all the way into the New Testament. Oftentimes, we look at Christianity as a religion of grace, and there is no need for law. There is no more law. And that, quite frankly, is not true. Yes, we do not look to the law to save us. We do not look to the law to bring us any sort of righteousness. We look to Christ and Christ alone for righteousness. But we look to the law as the law. When Jesus gives a commandment to us, we're not like, oh, Jesus, that was a great suggestion. I'll take it into consideration if I want to obey. No, we say, my Lord, curios, my owner has commanded this. I must obey. That's law. Now, it's law combined with the beauty of the gospel that understands I am under grace. I have been saved, not through my own effort, not through my own law keeping. Yet, because of what Christ has done for me, I seek to obey and I seek to live and I seek to walk in this righteousness. Back in Genesis, we see the first giving of the law. This is the law in creation. Adam was given a very simple law. Don't eat from this one tree, Adam. Right? In the day that you eat of this, you will die. One effectual law. It's known as the covenant of works. Had he obeyed perfectly, the tree of life would have been his to eat from. He would have earned his righteousness, earned his eternal life through his law keeping. He did not. He failed. He brought death. Because one man's sin, death entered it in, and death spread to all men for all men have sinned. Romans 5, 12. Now Christ comes onto the scene ages later, to fulfill that very covenant of works. He comes, he lives a life of perfect obedience, perfect righteousness, walks in every law given. And what does he merit? He merits eternal life. Does he need eternal life? No, because he is without sin. Therefore, death has no hold on him. But what does he do with that eternal life he has merited? He offers it freely in the gospel to us through faith by his grace. The next giving of the law we see is in Noah, after the flood, right? God hits the big old reset button, wipes out the entire earth in judgment, except for eight souls in the ark. And he says, all right, guys, one commandment didn't work out for you. Let's expand this out, right? And he gives the Noahic covenant, this idea of an expansion of law giving for mankind to guide them as they are now, again, fruitful and multiply. And we still see these kind of intrinsic things. Do not take the life of another. If you take the life of another, your life will be required. We see the establishment of civil government in the Noahic Covenant. The idea of there's authorities over you. Why? Because rebel sinners need authority. We need a law over us. If we are left to our own devices, if we are left without a ruler, you, you, you know what's going to happen. Right, guys? You can see it happening even in our own world today. People want to cast off authority. They want to cast off rule. And the only thing that is left there is sin. And sin is destructive. Now, the most familiar one you guys are going to be with is the law of Moses. We see this in the books of Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. This kind of encapsulation of 613 commandments. And you're like, wow, praise God that I'm under grace. I don't have to follow 613 commandments. Uh, you're right. Christ did it. Praise God. But understand that there is a reason for all of those laws. For us, as New Testament believers, like we don't cut off two-thirds of the Bible and say, the heck with this, I don't need the Old Testament. There is a learning tool for us in there. There is a, uh, a, a demarcation of what is righteous behavior in God's law. There is a great value and a beauty to the law for us as New Testament believers to go back and study. 
Particularly important is understanding, however, what was the purpose of the law for Israel. It was never the purpose of the law for the nation of Israel to save them. Okay? This is something that we're, again, we're going to be tying these points in throughout the entire day today. It was not the purpose of the law to save. It was the purpose of the law to demonstrate the sinfulness of man, our inability to come close to God, and what God required as far as a life of holiness and righteousness, set apart from all other nations. So when the Israelites were following the law and they were doing the thing as the nation of God's people in the promised land, their adherence to the law was what made them separate from the Canaanites, what made them separate from the Hivites. The Philistines, they did their child sacrifice thing, they did their false gods, they did their ritualistic worship, not so for Israel. Israel followed after the one true God. Israel worshipped according to the pattern of God. Israel lived according to the pattern of God. They ate according to the pattern of God. They worshipped according to the pattern of God. They dressed according to the pattern. Everything was patterned for them so that they would be separate and distinct. And again, not to prove or earn holiness for themselves, but to show what the requirement for God's people is. In Leviticus 19.2, God says, You must be holy, for I am holy. That's a really tall order, is it not? Good luck with that, I would even say, because you're going to fail, like now, and then tomorrow, and you're going to continue to fail up to that standard. That is why it is impressively important that we rest not in our own effort, but the efforts of Christ. The law of Moses can be divided into three subsets. Each of these is in your book here as well. There is the civil, the moral, and the ceremonial law. I'm going to briefly touch on these each. And then we're going to go into the uses of the law for us as believers as an overview. The first form of law, we'll go with the moral law. The moral law is God's unchanging and eternal standard of what is and what is not sin. Key word there is as God is unchanging, so is his law. If murder was immoral and sinful in the beginning, murder is moral and sinful today. If theft If covetousness, if idolatry, you name it, if that was sin once, it is sin today. God does not change. His standard does not change. His righteousness does not change. And this is immensely important because it is not us as Christians. Everyone wants to dog on Christians. Why are you guys so hard? Why are you guys judging? Why do you guys say this, that, and the other thing? It's not us. It is God. And he is well within his right to dictate to his creation what is pleasing to him and what he rejects. And that is what he, we see throughout the entire moral law of God, which is typically understood as the Ten Commandments. That is the summary of the moral law. That's why we were offering the book by J.I. Packer. Highly recommend if you guys have not read uh, Packer's book on the Ten Commandments. It's a fantastic little devotional. goes through each of the Ten Commandments and an application for believers today. Because again, while we do not adhere to the Ten Commandments for salvation, our salvation is solely of grace based upon the work of Christ. When our Savior and when our Lord says, this is what is sin, abstain from it. We say, yes, Lord. And we look to the model, and we look to the pattern, and we observe what is written for us in the Word. So we have moral law. The next thing we have is civil law. Now, these are probably the most boring of all the laws for us to read when we go through uh, the Old Testament, and you're like, good gracious, when is this ever going to end? I don't care about having to have a balcony on my roof. I don't care about mixing linen and cotton. I don't care about planting seeds. And this. I don't get this. None of this applies to me. And I would say, yes, none of it does apply to you. You are not a Jew living in Israel in the days of Moses. But that does not mean it is pointless for you. Okay, The civil law is really an expansion and an expounding of the moral law. For example, if the moral law says you shall not commit murder, right? Fifth commandment, shall not commit murder. Sixth commandment, I'm sorry. (laughs) I really studied for this one, guys. Sixth (laughs) commandment is you shall not commit murder. Right, So extrapolate that out. Not only should I not commit murder, I should protect life. If I am therefore bound by God to protect the life of my neighbor so that I can love my neighbor, that means that I may need to provide a, a fence along my rooftop. So that when my, you know, we got the, the, the we're 
Israel, we got our, 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 our barbecue going, we're hanging out, we're fellowshipping, right? And, and maybe Lee just loses her footing and falls off the roof of my house and dies. That's on me. <laughs> so you made that comment, Lee, so you just put yourself right out there. No, so this is, this is the idea of, 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 of I'm looking out for her best interest in a passive way, not actively. I'm not like holding her hand the entire time while we're up you know, on the roof enjoying fellowship time, but I'm looking to love my neighbor and care for them, so I'm going beyond what is required of me to prepare and, and, and set apart safety and protection. Part of the civil law is also that if I have a, a donkey or an ox or some sort of animal that is known to be aggressive, I must take measures to protect my neighbor so that it does not strike them or gore them. And you're like, I don't raise livestock anymore. Why do I need to know this? Because in your life, maybe you know, a modern day application, you have a dog that's a jerk. And your dog likes to bite people. You need to make sure that dog is not near people so that you can better love your neighbor. See, there's application we can draw from all of these laws to today. Not necessarily a one-for-one, one because that's not, it was, again, it was written for people thousands of years ago in the Middle East. But we can understand that the civil law existed to extrapolate and expand the moral law so that I can have case study to better love my neighbor. Lastly is the ceremonial law. This is the one that everybody loves, right? We love reading about, like, Leviticus chapter 15, the laws of bodily discharges, right? We just mentioned this last Sunday, for those of you who are here. We love reading about all the gallons of blood that are flowing in the sacrifices, right? We love reading about leprosy. We love reading... No, we don't. But we're like, why do I have to read this disgusting chapter on, on, on bodily discharge, or why does everyone always have a scab that they need to inspect by the priest, or why, you know, and, and, and let's be honest, guys, in, in, in our understanding of, of cleanliness and hygiene, how does taking the blood of a heifer and sprinkling it over a bowl not make that clean? I don't want to drink from that bowl. In fact, I don't want to touch that bowl. It's covered in blood. It's gross and disgusting, because the purpose of this was a ceremonial spiritual application. The ceremonial law existed to show mankind our natural condition of uncleanness, right? If you go through the law, you can't go one day without being unclean. You touch a dead, a dead corpse like you're, you're, you're cooking your chicken for dinner. You've touched something dead. You are now unclean. You cannot go before the temple unless you are ritually purified first. You got an open wound. You're unclean. You touch something. You, 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 there's rules about where to go to the bathroom, in the nation. Now again, hygiene is awesome. We love hygiene, as we've seen by the last couple months of pandemic. Wash your hands, please. But understand that that was not the purpose of the ceremonial law. The purpose of the ceremonial law was to show just how unfit to come before the presence of God we humans are because of our sinful, natural condition. And there's this incredibly elaborate setup. You've got to wash this many times in this fashion. You have to offer this animal sacrifice for this. You have to offer this blood offering for sin. You have to pour forth this oil or wine offering for this, that, or the other thing. And you look at it and you say, this is exhausting. How did the people of Israel do this for thousands of years? And you say, you begin to think about it and say, yes, it is exhausting. Yes, it is a, a, a weight and a burden because the point was is mankind needs to know just how burdensome our sin is. And again, you look at how bloody the ceremonial sacrifices are. And you go to the book of Kings, when Solomon opens the, the temple to dedication, there are literally hundreds of thousands of just cows in one day that were sacrificed, blood poured out. The, it was like a river of blood flowing out of the temple. And for those of us who don't like, do our own food preparation, you just go to the grocery store, you're like, hey, there's a frozen pack of meat. Clunk, there's my pound of meat. I don't have to know how it got there. I don't have to go through the process of it being ground up. I don't have to know anything except it put in my mouth and it tastes good. But for the Jewish people, day in and day out, every day sacrifices would be offered. Every day, animals were, were, were giving their lives, blood was pouring out, particularly the Passover lamb, which was an, an important sacrifice because the family had to raise that lamb. They had to live with it for a week, and then the dad had to kill it. Right? This is like now a family pet, 
And dad has to take out the family pet, kill it, cook it, and now we're all going to eat it. Right? That's nasty. We don't like that. But the purpose is to show how grievous our sin is, that all of these animals would have to give their lives as a substitute. That little lamb didn't do anything. He was just living his best lamb life to the glory of God, growing wool and... Ah, you know, it was cute. And then he died. And he had to die because of me, because of you. And the weight of that washes over the Jewish people as they begin to look at and see the weight and the cost of their sin. Okay? So we look at that now, we're like, well, what, what the, why do I have to read about that? Jesus came and died, and his sacrifice atoned and washed for my sins perfectly. It's no longer this sacrificial system. Why do I have to know about the ceremonial law? Because when we begin to ascertain exactly the depths and the requirements of that law, we can better see our own sin and the holiness of God, and we can therefore greatly worship Christ, because we do not have to go through that. We do not have to be the one whose blood is shed. We do not have to be the one constantly going through ritual after ritual. We can rest in the finished work of Christ. And we praise him for that. So last thing I want to... Last thing that I want to work on is the three uses. I'm not going to point there. Three <laughs> uses of the law. This encompasses the law as a whole. Whether it's moral, civil, or ceremonial. Right? When we look through the scriptures... And we're uh, reading all of this law. And i got to affirm and remind you guys that there is law in Old Testament and there is law in New Testament. Just like there is grace in New Testament and there is grace in the Old Testament, it's not two separate books. It's one whole redemptive story. So when we come to the law, it doesn't matter if I'm reading an Old Testament passage or a New Testament passage. I can use this text in one of three ways. The first use of the law, and this is one of the most important. This is going to segue into Luke's talk next. The law serves to show exactly how sinful I am, how far I am from God, how unholy I am in comparison to his holiness, and how hopeless my situation is, because if God commands me, be holy as I am holy, I'm done. I have no hope. And that's exactly what the law is there to do. It is to drive me to the knees, drive me to the foot of the cross, drive me to hopelessness and despair in myself, and to cast myself upon the mercy of my God who would send his son to die in my place. The law shows us our need for Christ. Second use of the law. This is merely the idea that law restrains evil. You may be a completely unregenerate, God-hating individual, and you can... Uh, be persuaded by the law to not commit a crime. Okay? If we're back in the Old Testament era, right, the law of Moses is the law of our land, and I'm sitting there and I might be like, you know what? I really feel like stealing my neighbor's heifer. That's a mighty fine heifer. I could use that thing. But if I steal it, I might die. Hmm. I like living. I like the heifer. I like living more. I might have no heart desiring to serve God, no heart desiring to walk after righteousness, no heart desiring to love and respect my neighbor. My heart might be so inward and wicked that I only want to serve myself, but because I want to serve myself and I don't want to die, I'm not going to steal that heifer. Because every one of the Ten Commandments carries the death penalty. In fact, every sin, every violation of God's moral law bears the death penalty. Why? Because the sin leads to death. The wages of sin is death. We see this all throughout the moral law of God. Out of pure fear, the second use of the law says the, the law can restrain the wicked hands of man even if their heart has not been changed. So first use is to drive us before Christ. We need to know the depths of our depravity. The second use, we understand that the law restrains even those who have no respect for God or for his law. And then the third use, this will tie in with Pastor Joe's talk, the third use of the law is for the believer. The heart that has been regenerated. The heart that has been filled with the Spirit of God in the vein of Ezekiel 36 when he says to us, I will put my Spirit in you. I will cause you to walk in my laws and my statutes. My law will be a delight unto you. Now very often we look at the Old Testament law and we're like, David must have been high or something. How can he say that this is a delight? How can he say he loves this? 
Well, when we understand that what God is speaking about in Ezekiel 36 and what David is always speaking about in the Psalms is that when the law comes before us as a guide for living, as a rule for life to seek after righteousness, I cannot go wrong in following this law. There is no death to be had for me as I walk after righteousness. Now, I am thousands of years separated from the nation of Israel. I am not bound by these laws. They are not the law of the land. The Constitution is the law of the land in America. I am not bound ceremonially to keep an obedience to these laws. My sacrifice is Christ. I am still bound by the words of Christ himself to love my God and to love my neighbor. And if you're wondering, well, how do I effectively love my God and love my neighbor? I would turn you to the law. Because again, the purpose of the law is to, to, to cause us to flee from sin and to walk in love to our neighbor. And there is a great delight in this. There's a great beauty in this aspect. Because I don't have to question, is this thing pleasing to God or not? If it's in his law, it is pleasing. I don't have to question, is this going to lead to me to have problems? Is this going to lead to death or to sin? Because it's in God's law. I can look at this as the guide for my life, knowing that as I walk in obedience to these things, not for salvation, but as a result of the salvation freely given to me, the Lord is well pleased. Okay, just to recap, three uses of the law. First, to show you your desperate need for Christ. Two, to restrain the wickedness of sinful men who may not have any love for God. But three, for you, believer, for you who love the Lord your God with all your heart, strength, soul, and mind, it is the guide to show you life. Christ walked in perfect obedience to the law because we cannot. But now, empowered by the Holy Spirit, we can be given that new heart that has a desire to walk in as much obedience as I am able. And therefore, we realize that we are walking pleasing to the Lord. I want to leave you with this last quote from Augustine. If you guys don't know who St. Augustine of Hippo is, he's my jam. He's a fantastic early theologian. But he has some of the best lines uh, around. But this particular line says, Thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless till they find their rest in thee. This is going to segue into Luke. Unless you have been transformed by the gospel, you will never have any rest. The law will be a constant curse and burden. The, it's the guillotine waiting over your neck because we all intrinsically know we have violated God's law. But in the gospel, there is rest. But even in the gospel, we can have this understanding and this, this, this ache in our heart that I, I feel like God would have me live in a certain way to his glory. Yes, believer, because your heart is still restless because you're trying to find your own path to obedience. Look to the law of God. Look to it as your framework and your guideline. And you will have your delight in the Lord as you rest in Christ, knowing that your obedience is not what matters. It is Christ's obedience, 110%. Yet I have the privilege to look to God's word to guide and be the lamp to my feet.